So, um, as, uh, as I mentioned before, there is a very strong contingent of sophisticated people at Northeastern University thinking uh, about these, uh, these issues, and uh, it is now my distinctive pleasure to introduce not only one, but two of them to talk to us about the topic of the next session, which is, your topic keeps getting longer, right? It used to be... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So the, <laughs> so the topic is contextualizing fairness and transparency in AI and ML, addressing the last mile problem in AI ethics with committee-based oversight. And anything concerned with committee-based oversight requires at least two authors, so that there's a collective weight behind that. So this is a joint paper between John Basil and uh, Ron Sandler, who have done a fair amount of collaborative work together, which I personally think philosophers should do more of anyway. So you guys set a good example for the field there also. So please join me in welcoming them uh, both here. When you're uh, asked to give a title for a talk, you give something vague so you don't have to commit to what you're going to talk about in advance, and then you add the subtitle later. At least that's my strategy. Uh, thanks, Matthias, for having us on the Car Center and all the other organizations that are hosting. Um, I'm going to I'm going to do the talk, uh, but Ron, uh, welcome to, to chime in at any point. Um, he'll be around during the Q and A. He'll help me answer some questions when I get stuck. Um, what uh, I want to start by saying something about um, thanks. From our perspective, the state of AI ethics in general and fairness and transparency in particular, um, it's been a while now that there's been a general recognition within computer science and engineering that AI, AI and ML are going to be disruptive, raising serious ethical challenges. Um, philosophers and ethicists have been relatively slow to get into the game, with, with some minor exceptions. Um, I think early on there was some hope among computer scientists that when they ran into a problem of fairness that the philosophers were going to have some off-the-self solution. We were going to hand it over. They were going to operationalize it, and we were going to be off to the races. Um, I think that's only a slight caricature of what computer scientists thought. Uh, on the one hand, it's nice that they thought we could be helpful. Um, on the other hand, it became apparent very, uh, very quickly that this hope was in vain, and there's a lot of work to be done to translate whatever resources philosophers have and ethicists have to something useful for developing AI systems, fair AI systems. Um, there's been some really interesting work done already on some of the ethical problems raised by AI, but unfortunately, there's also still just a lot of developing ethics platforms and declarations of the values that we're supposed to care about. Um, and there's still a lot of work of getting from those values that we've articulated to actually putting into practice fair algorithms, transparent algorithms, ethical algorithms. Uh, so, we're now facing maybe, uh, or starting to face, what uh, is called the last mile problem. Last mile problems in the domain of supply chain management refer to the fact that the last mile of resource delivery is always the hardest and most inefficient. It's easy to get big chunks of stuff into places and then to get it delivered to the people who actually need it's really hard. Um, and we started thinking about uh, developing fair, just, transparent, uh, ethical algorithms as coming into that point. We've got these values that we want. How do we actually deliver algorithms that meet our ethical standards? So this talk is going to be a bit about how to, we're not going to solve that problem today, um, but start talking about a method we think is useful for solving that problem. Um, so uh, here's the structure of the presentation. I'm going to start by highlighting the fact that there's no question of fairness or transparency in AI. There's a host of questions about these issues. Um, and that is a general theme of yet of since Cynthia's talk on Friday night through yesterday, some of today. Um, and in doing so, in highlighting those distinct questions, we're gonna, I want to highlight the ways in which answers to those questions are highly context sensitive. Um, meaning there's not going to be, even, in, um, even for any given question of fairness, there's not going to be a single answer. It's going to be extremely context sensitive. Furthermore, I want to highlight the fact that it's not just a matter of figuring out what your context is within any given context it's really hard to figure out what the right answer is. So sometimes when you realize that a challenge is context sensitive, you realize, oh, once I fix the context, that tells me what to do. That's not going to be the case here, so I want to highlight that. And then finally, you want to explain why committee-based oversight is a promising tool for addressing the diff these difficulties. Um, and then outline the process by which we're gonna, we want to develop committee-based oversight to address those challenges. Okay. So start on the challenges of fairness. I'm going to start by fairness, then I'll do a little bit on transparency. Um, so, so what is fairness? I want to distinguish between four different questions or challenges of fairness in AI. Uh, before doing that, just a brief note that for most of the, the talk, I'm going to not focus on um, the possibility of implementing an, a, a hybrid system where it's a human and an AI 
um, in tandem where the AI or the algorithm provides info to a human decision maker. I think all the problems still arise in that context. The, the problems, the, the questions that are gonna raise, they arise for that system too, but it is an important question that we think maybe our model will help address. <clears throat> um, so the first question I wanna highlight is, what kind of fairness should we be thinking about? Uh, the answer to what kind of fairness we should be thinking about depends a lot on the kind of application or use to which we're putting a predictive system. So take recidivism prediction or compass um, system, which hopefully many of you are aware of. Um, when we think about fairness in this context, the kind of fairness we might be primarily concerned with is anti-discrimination or anti-bias. We want to ensure that the predictions made by the system aren't violating requirements that we consider people of, for example, different races or different sexes differently. Um, we want to make sure they're, they're considered equally in our decision making process. But take in the case of an automated lending system, we, we might care about that, we might care that it's unbiased in that way, but we might care also about, or, or more importantly about, fairness and outcomes. We wanna ensure that when we turn over lending decisions to an autonomous system, it doesn't increase or exacerbate existing inequalities, make that worse. Um, so we might care about that in recidivism prediction too, we don't wanna exacerbate existing inequalities, but there, there are different questions of fairness and you might emphasize them differently in different contexts. Uh, and as a matter of fact, most of the work in AI fairness has been focused on this anti-bias question and not enough, where you do see some focus on the um, uh, disparate in impact problem is in the economic impacts of AI. Um, so there's been different domains where people focusing on these different questions, but in the fairness literature, it's mostly on anti-bias. Second question of fairness with respect to AI is um, how best to operate, once you pick a kind of fairness, how do you operationalize it? What's the, what's the way you take that kind of fairness and put it into an algorithm? Um, and here there's been some serious work. Um, IBM has a suite of algorithms uh, you can use to address their different metrics for fairness. It's called the Fairness 360 Project. I'd encourage you to go play around with it. Um, Google has its own suite of algorithms for sort of operationalizing standards of fairness. They talk about what those things are. Um, I was gonna do some slides on the Fairness 360 Project, but I cut them because Cynthia's talk was about exactly this problem. It was about how do we think about operationalizing fairness and what are some of the problems, of how, what do they tell us when they're breached, things like that. So that's the question of how to operationalize fairness. So you set, once you settle on a kind of fairness, you solve this problem of what's the right operationalization. Third question of fairness. Um, how does fairness relate to and trade off against other values? Fairness isn't the only thing we care about and we should care about. Um, so to see the importance of this question, compare recidivism prediction, which I've already talked about it, and uh, diagnostics, medical diagnostics. In the case of a recidivism prediction, I think we should have a very low tolerance for bias. So even if the algorithm is highly accurate otherwise, or even because of biases, the accuracy might be there or echo biases that we have, and we might think we shouldn't be tolerant of that in this application. But in the case of medical diagnostics, I think it's at least an open question, um, and I'm pretty convinced by this, that um, predictive accuracy is the primary value, because what we care about is health outcomes. So even if the, if the biases are coming in, but for every group for which we do predictions, the medical diagnostics are better than the alternative doctor predictions. Sorry, any doctors in the room. Um, uh, if the medical diagnostic predictions are better, then that's a reason to, care, to, to discount or dismiss, maybe not dismiss, discount worries about bias, bias in the data. Um, so we have to ask questions about, should we care about fairness in this context at all? Um, okay. Fourth question. Uh, fourth question is about whether fairness can even be achieved by an algorithmic system. And I don't mean this either in the um, technical sense of can we operationalize it or in the sense of like should we ever allow algorithms to make any decisions, but there are clearly contexts where it does seem inappropriate that an algorithm would have certain kinds of input. So um, as an example, consider jury trials. It seems like what it means for a verdict in a jury trial to be fair is partly constituted by the fact that the verdict is issued by a jury of one's peers. Even if an algorithm could perfectly predict what a jury of one's peers would say, we might think it is not legitimate to allow that algorithm any role in the verdict process. Uh, because procedural justice is what we care about, not um, fairness in outcomes or fairness in inputs, any of that. We care about the actual decision-making procedure. So these are four distinct questions. Um, uh, they all go to show that there's ambiguity, ambiguity in what we're asking about when we ask about fairness in AI. Um, and under each disambiguation, there's still room for pluralism of answers depending on the context we're interested in. Um, but I, I wanna make a further point, and that's that um, you might think 
like I said at the beginning, once you've picked out the context and you have the details of the context, that sort of might settle the questions of fairness. So like medical, the way I portrayed medical diagnostics, like it seems pretty clear that the thing we care about is accuracy rather than fairness. Um, but not all contexts are gonna be like that. Some of these contexts raise these questions and there's no clear answer. So take for example, uh, Allegheny County Protective Services has an algorithm that's used to predict whether or make a prediction about whether a child should be put into foster care, removed from their parents' care and put into foster care. Um, now this is a case where it raises, I think, every single one of these questions of fairness, right? And um, I, I, we've been working on this in tandem with some people at, at Northeastern, I'll talk about a bit more about that later, but I really have no idea which values to privilege. Should we focus primarily on the welfare of the child or should we be really sensitive to the fact that um, the algorithm might be biased by things like race or sex or things like that? Um, like if the child is, is living with a male parent and those they get worse outcomes. Should we care more about that or should we care about the welfare of the child? So um, it's not gonna, we're not gonna solve these problems just by being clear about the context. So we're gonna have to do some serious deliberation in each of them. I wanna echo these uh, or make similar remarks about transparency. Uh, we've only been sort of getting into the transparency discourse a little bit um, more recently. Um, we've been following it a lot less closely than the other fairness issues. Um, but one interesting recent move in the philosophy literature on transparency has been a move to argue that our calls for tra transparency rely on a mistaken picture about the kinds of transparency humans are capable of. So the standard transparency criticism is that um, algorithms are a black box and so they're not understandable. And there's a group of philosophers, uh, mostly philosophers out of New Zealand, that have tried to argue that like, well, we're actually kind of a black box too. You, when you call for, when you want to know like how humans make decisions, you don't actually want to know and you couldn't find out how the inner workings of their brain works to try to get what those decisions uh, are. Um, it's a really fun paper. Roughly they start with um, the true insight that you can't really get inside the brain of someone um, and figure out how their decisions are made in terms of some inner mechanistic thing. But that seems to be what people are demanding in the algorithmic case and they say that's the wrong thing to be asking for. Um, instead. Uh, we should think about demands for, it's not about transparency, it's about explainability, and the rough idea is that um, uh, we can get explanations out of AI. There are different kinds of explanations on offer, um, and so they sort of highlight a bunch of them. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but they offer sort of four distinct kinds of explanations that even a black box AI can offer. They offer what are called, they call input influence um, explanations, uh, based explanations, so that's when a decision is made about some user, and what is provided to them is, um, these are the factors and the strength of their relevance to our decision. So what inputs from you generated this decision, or were most strength, strongly involved in influencing this decision? Demographic-based uh, explanations, they provide, you provide a list of the demographics that the individual is in, and what percentage of them were in various decision categories. So if you're doing insurance, it'll say something like 20% of women were in this category, 20% of people aged 18 to 35 were in this category. So you get a list of all the demographics. Uh, Case-based, you're matched with a case that was very similar to yours. So they say like, th your case was very similar to this case. Here are the factors in their case that you're very closely aligned with. And this was the decision made about this person. So that's a kind of explanation. And then there's sensitivity-based explanations would tell you things like, if you drove 10% less at night, you would have had cheaper insurance. Like it points out the demographic categories that you're a part of and what that means for where you got placed in your decision. Um, and so they say, look, yeah, there's um, all these different decision categories, um, <clears throat> uh, but um, since we have all these available explanations, what we should think about is can, do any of these explanations match the types of explanations given by humans that would be appropriate for a given context? And if so, they, they endorse what they call a single standard view. They don't like the double standard that we should, that we uh, hold the algorithms to a higher standard than humans. So anytime you have a parity between the kind of explanation an algorithm can offer and the kind of explanation a human can offer, substitution is fine. Um, so two comments about this. Um, first, uh, so that call their view is single standard view. First, um, even if we think they're right about the single standard view, it's still context, context dependent which kind of explanation is appropriate. Got to think carefully about what kinds of explanations are appropriate in different contexts. And that's going to matter because what motivates our view about the oversight committee stuff is that oversight committees are especially good at dealing with context sensitive questions. Um, but second, uh, the single standard view is not very plausible. Um, just like procedural justice, it just seems pretty implausible. It, it's, what matters in explainability is not the kind of explanation always, but I'm owed an explanation by another individual. I deserve, as a matter of respect, deserve to have been heard by someone that understands the nuances of my position, even if they ultimately deny me. So it may be that the appropriateness of explainability is a function of some relation I bear to the explainer, not just the intrinsic properties of the explanation. 
So what should we do about this? <clears throat> um, so a lot of that that we've said so far, that's, I went pretty quickly, but that's just because it emphasizes things that have been said over the last couple of days. The question really is, what's the best way to address these problems? The fact that these things are context sensitive and we need to answer them carefully. Um, uh, and we, we think um, the answer is that a committee-based oversight approach is a really useful tool. Maybe it's not the only tool. We, we think there's other important issues for addressing this, how, uh, addressing the problem of how do we get from these context sensitive sensitivity problems, which everybody's already recognized in the last couple of days, to actual, here's what you should do with your algorithm, or here's when an algorithm should be held back. Um, the committee-based approach is modeled after approaches we use to resolve ethical challenges in other domains, particularly in research subjects oversight. Um, and I'll mention a couple of those as we go through. Um, but I want to start by contrasting our preferred method with two others, two other oversight models, um, the strict compliance model and what I'm going to call the in-situ ethics model. So to, to, to start, the strict compliance model, that's um, according to a strict com compliance model, you write a set of strict criteria you want to be met, and then you enforce compliance with those criteria. Something like this is the model for safety standards and what OSHA does, um, or standards for restaurants. If you see those A's in front of a restaurant, that's a strict compliance model. There's, you've got a checklist, you make sure they satisfy the things, that's what happens. Um, and we think this model is pretty much a no-go for oversight of AI and ML. Um, there's too much variety in the applications we want to oversee to have any carefully, clearly written standards like that. Um, so you run into this problem, either you make the standards too lax and there's too much um, unethicality, or you make them so restricted that companies are just too restricted for realizing the genuine benefits of AI and ML. Um, a slightly better model uh, is what we're going to call the in-situ ethics model. Um, I don't know if you guys know about the AI ethics lab, it's actually run out of Boston. Um, John Sujanja is in charge of that. Uh, we actually had her up to Northeastern a couple weeks ago to talk about these things. She doesn't like our model. Um, uh, her preferred model is that you basically train up ethicists to be a part of the design procedures in tech firms. So you're going to put ethicists in the design process, their collaborative component of that process. It sort of echoes, sort of, I think, what the embedded ethics program is meant to train people up to do. And we're not opposed to that as a project. We think you need to build lots of ethical capacity. Having coders and ethicists as part of the design process is desirable. Um, but we actually don't think this is a good model for addressing all the challenges in AI, uh, primarily because um, this is not a problem just for ethicists and computer scientists to solve. Uh, when you're trying to solve a problem, for example, what to do about the child protective services case, you, ethicists and computer scientists aren't enough. You need domain specific, you need legal scholars, you need um, people working in social services to tell you about that domain so the ethicists can actually get some traction. Um, uh, yeah, we'll go into that a little more later. Um, secondly, uh, uh, another problem with that model is we, we actually just don't have enough ethicists. Um, and there aren't enough graduate programs churning out ethics. Graduate programs in the United States do not produce applied philosophers. That is not their business. They don't see it as their business. So it's actually rare that they end up doing it. So um, it'd be great. It's hard to sort of speak against this model because it would incentivize producing a lot more philosophers, which how could I oppose that? But um, uh, it's, we, don't, we don't have that kind of ethical capacity now. The committee-based model, we actually think it's, we're a lot closer to having the capacity for that, partly because there are extant models that call on that kind of expertise. So some virtues of some additional virtues of committee-based oversight besides the fact that they avoid those problems. Um, it's really nice that we have extant models to draw on. So we have three models that we've been looking at. IRBs, institutional review boards, for those that aren't familiar, those are the review boards that look at all research protocols for human subject research. So researchers write up a protocol of what they're gonna do, explaining their consent processes and things like that. They submit them to the IRB. They can't do anything until the IRB approves. Uh, there's a similar kind of committee with very different kinds of values for governing animal care, uh, animal research. Um, and then there's what are called embryonic stem cell research oversight committees. We're sort of particularly interested in those because they're really, they're neat for this reason. Um, they arose during the Bush, George W. Bush years. And they arose because there was basically going to be no mandates from the government about how to ethically oversee the use of stem cells because they just weren't going to fund any of it. And so industry and academia actually partnered together to develop these oversight committees independent of government regulation, which might be a really useful model in thinking about AI oversight because it looks like that's the state of affairs. Um, there's going to be relatively low, I know most about the AV space, I've worked on a, program, a project with Jeff, and it looks like there's just so little legal guidance. Um, and so you might need to use a model that's based on public-private partnership, or sorry, uh, academic, institutional, uh, academic and corporate partnership to develop these models. 
Um, so it's really nice to have those models to draw on in developing these. They're also good because there are bad features of these things. IRBs, uh, one of the complaints I have about IRBs is that there's actually no requirement that an ethicist be on them. There's no strict requirement about what experts are on them. So we can look at these models for where they fail and how to do them better. So that's, so that's one nice feature of the uh, committee-based oversight models. We have standing models. Uh, secondly, they're well suited to rapidly changing technological landscapes. You can, if you have a pile of experts, a pile of experts, that's the technical term. Um, if you have a pile of experts and you can swap in experts in and out, you can deal with new, new problems as they arise. Um, they, be, if you compose them correctly, you can actually address a wide range of challenges. One of the things we really like about this is that it's not going to be helpful in just addressing fairness in AI, and in fact, a fairness and transparency in AI. We actually came to it through thinking how these things could address an entirely different problem that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, they're also really useful if, if staffed correctly for avoiding conflicts of interest. One thing that's common, for example, on IACOOX is that you have to have a non-institutional member. So you can't just have members of the institution rubber stamping animal research. Um, there's got to be someone outside sort of giving their influence to. Um, so that can help avoid conflicts of interest. Uh, and they, they also sort of capture this democratic feature that is um, you have a bunch of different people, some from inside the institution, some from outside the institution. Um, and sort of often there's a public member, someone representing the public, so you can get, it's not quite democracy because it's not like we're gonna invite everyone to these committees, no company would allow that. Um, but you do get representation from the public and have them at least voice their concerns. So these are just some additional virtues. All right, so what do they look like? Um, so if we're right up that they're promising, the question then becomes how do you build these committees out? Um, and here's where it's really nice to have extant models to look at. Um, and we can look at not only how they resolve various problems, but the process through which they're constructed. And if you look at the history of, for example, institutional review boards or IACOOCs, well, the first thing you'll notice is that they're developed, in, they're developed in light of some massive ethical transgression. Let's skip that part <laughs> if we can. Um, uh, but second, you'll see the process by which they're developed was, was by first identifying a set of ethical values that we want to either preserve or promote. Um, and then you ask the question, well, what kind of committee carrying out what kind of procedure with what kinds of powers situated where in an institution is best suited to realizing, promoting, protecting those values? So you can use that same procedure in the A space. You can ask, okay, here's what we want to do. Here are the values we care about. How do we compose the committee? How do we uh, give, what procedures do we assign them? What powers do we give them? And where do we situate them in the institution? Answering those questions, um, by answering those questions, you can build effective oversight. So here's just as a quick model of the value side for human subject research. Um, after the Tuskegee syphilis experiments, a commission was formed. They issued the Belmont Report, um, which is the foundation of governance of human subject research in the US, in addition to the Declaration of Helsinki. Um, and the, the foundations are grounded in three distinct values, respect for persons, well-being, and justice. And then each of those values gets operationalized into a specific set of more um, more action guiding principles, though not perfectly action guiding, but you get informed consent um, is what is how we capture primarily capture respect for persons. Uh, well being is uh, captured by principles of beneficence, which means make sure your experiment's actually generating a good. Non maleficence, make sure it doesn't put your research subjects at too much risk. And then there's a justice is captured by special protections for vulnerable populations. So it's extremely hard, for example, to do research on prison populations or especially children in foster care, for example. Um, and then what the committee's job is, in all these cases, is to sort of look at these specific operation, operationalizations and ask, um, is, the consent, is the consent procedure sufficient? Does it provide enough understanding for the person to provide informed consent? Is the thing, is, are things, incentives being framed in such a way that it's manipulative or coercive? Um, and that's where they're sort of, that's their task, is to make those kinds of judgments. Turning now to the, uh, uh, the oversight committees for AI fairness and uh, transparency, we can sort of co-op those same values to think about transparency and fairness. So we can think about demands for transparency in terms of respect for persons. Um, the reason you have, to, what, what it means, this is what I was talking about with the explanations being sort of something, a relational property. Um, the reason you have to be transparent is like that's just a matter of respect. But there's gonna be other ways of operationalizing respect for persons in terms of demands for privacy. So it's not gonna just be tri transparency, it's also gonna, uh, indicate that we should care about privacy. And then justice, you can think about justice in terms of specific norms for fairness and consideration, that's the anti-bias stuff, um, and fairness and outcomes, that's the distribution, distributive justice stuff. Um, but th the reason we were motivated to think about these things in the first place is because they're actually useful for protecting and promoting a whole range of values. So it's not just about respect for persons and justice, but also well-being, 
Um, democracy, one of the things that I think is most scary about algorithms is the ways that they impact democratic processes. Um, we've seen a lot of that with Facebook um, and Cambridge Analytica, uh, and we think that you can protect and promote these values with a committee-based model. And what really motivated us to start thinking about it was questions of moral status. There have been some talks today about the possibility of creating artificial intelligence that are due moral consideration. Um, and one of the things I tend to think is that if we're gonna do that, it's not like we're gonna go right to human level AI, we're gonna create like animal level consciousness AI. And so we thought, well, couldn't we just extend the Aya Cook oversight model to sort of think about protecting those kinds of research subjects? And so that's sort of what got us motivated to think about these things anyway. But the general point is just, we can. there's a bunch of ethical values associated with artificial intelligence. We think the oversight model is promising for addressing a huge range of them. And not just for AI, Ron's gonna probably wanna mention in the Q&A, but this also applies to data gathering activities and things like that. Um, okay, so then the question is, those four questions, how do we compose, what kind of procedures, what kind of powers, and where in the institution? So we've mostly thought about composition. Um, so for composition, it seems pretty clear that you need textual, technical expertise, ethical expertise, domain specific expertise. We didn't used to leave legal expertise on here, but every time we give this talk, or talk like it, the lawyers chime in and say, why aren't there lawyers on your committees? <laughs> um, uh, we also think it's important to have a public representative and then a non-conflicted participant. Now the way these roles are usually met in other committees is that you can have one person that satisfies multiple, so this doesn't indicate the total number of individuals. Um, uh, and the reason we think we need these things is partly based on experience. So we at Northeastern have a small group working on the like the Allegheny case, like how could you write an algorithm that's, used, that's fair and useful in helping to make decisions about whether we own children. And the best interactions occur between our domain specialist, someone who works in social, social work, and our um, computer scientists. The computer scientists will say things like, well the kind of data I want is things like how much food is in the child's refrigerator, and then the um, eyes of our social worker just go like this. <laughs> um, because that's parental advocates are never gonna allow that kind of data gathering. And so these interactions of sort of what the technical, technical expert wants and what sort of is gonna be legally attainable, those, those interactions are uh, really important and help sort of inform um, uh, what is gonna constitute a doable or a useful fairness algorithm in these contexts. We have thought way less about the other components of this. Um, we're just starting to think about it and work on these. So mostly I'm just gonna raise questions about what the procedures are. So the question we have to answer with respect to procedures is what's the object of assessment? In research, sub in research subjects oversight, what you're assessing is a research program. But that doesn't seem like the right point of intervention in the case of algorithms. Uh, I, for the most part, I'm willing to allow Microsoft, if they're still here, uh, or Facebook, or whatever, do whatever research they want. It's at the, it's the point of when they want to deploy an application that we really want to start thinking about, is it fair? Um, but since they're also doing data collection, it might be at the point where say, you're starting to collect data from real users. And we don't really have a good answer here, and admit that might be a context-sensitive question, um, but what is it that we're trying to assess? And then what's the assessment tool gonna be? The standard assessment tool is a protocol. So before you do research, you submit a protocol that says, here are all the techniques I'm gonna use, here's how I'm getting informed consent, or here's the experiment that's being done on an animal, that's what gets assessed. But maybe that's not the right tool for assessment in this context, maybe, um, these committees go and there's a presentation that is given to them by the research team, and then these things are done in a much more tandem, collaborative way, and approval comes about as a part of a process like that. We don't know. Um, same with powers. So, um, IACUCs and IRBs are actually pretty powerful. They have the power to just halt research or just prevent it from starting. Um, but that might not be a workable solution in this space. Um, depends. Uh, it depends on how you get buy-in or where the normative source of these things comes from. Um, so it may be that they can prevent or halt development, and maybe they can recall applications or revoke access to data, but it may be that these committees just produce public disclosure documents that explain what the ethical challenges are for consumers, or maybe there's an ethics certification that happens, that a company goes through this process, they get ethics certified, and then they can have like a badge that says, this has gone through ethics review. Um, and that might be a PR coup for them, um, but it might also incentivize them to take these things seriously. Um, it also might be useful in solving the problem that was mentioned in the last talk of how do you get the sort of smaller firms on board with the ethical requirements. Uh, and then there's this question of institutional position. For all the oversight committees we currently have, institutions are, uh, oversight committees are housed internal to institutions. So every, Harvard has probably three or four R IRBs um, and three or four IACOCs. Um, but they're housed internal and they make, even though they have an outside member, they make judgments 
for the institution. But it may be that this is a case where maybe the car center is going to be the host of the AI Ethics Oversight Committee, and companies are going to submit their work to them. Now, both of these have advantages and disadvantages. Um, there's all sorts of IP concerns with having an external review board. Um, but it does allow you to have sort of experts. It allows you to house your experts in institutions. It also might give smaller companies access to institutional resources that they wouldn't otherwise have. So no startup has access to um, an ethos, a bunch of ethicists, some domain-specific experts, and legal scholars. So it might be a way to get around that. Um, so it might help. Might be a, there's a justice reason to have them be external or some hybrid of that. Uh, additional challenges. This is going to be expensive, um, and we don't quite have that. We do need to develop some capacity for this. Um, so that's a challenge. Where where are we going to get money to? Because academics are already overworked. If you ask them, they'll tell you that. Uh, and we also need more. We don't have enough ethicists of technology. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if like 10% of all the ethicists of technology in the world are at this conference. <laughs> um, and then another hard problem is going to be buy-in. How do you get corporations to submit themselves to this? Um, one might be law. We just it, we do some, someone does something so terrible that the government's just like you're going to do something like this. Or it could be through this ethics certification idea that we're going to certify things as ethical, and that's going to encourage companies to want to do it. Um, companies that don't will just be at a market disadvantage. So we, those are things we're considering, still thinking through how to pitch these things. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, algorithmic systems raise uh, raise a host of domain context-specific ethical challenges associated with fairness, transparency, other values. Uh, we think a good bet for addressing those challenges is committee-based oversight. Um, there are still significant challenges to developing and deploying such oversight. We'd really welcome the help. Um, right now, it's mostly just me and Ron and a very small group of people working on these things. Um, so I hope you'll continue to think about it and let us know where we're going wrong or where we're going right. Thanks.